Hello, everyone, and welcome to Keys to Success for your Integrated Summary of Safety and Integrated Summary of Efficacy, sponsored by Roe. I'm Rebecca Friend, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Ben Vaughn, Senior Statistical Scientist at Roe, and Rob Wilson, Statistical Scientist at Roe. You can read their full bios on the right side of your window. Just a few technical notes before we begin. If you have trouble reading a slide, please hold and drag the right corner of the slide window to enlarge. Please also disable your pop-up blockers to participate in the interactive parts of this presentation. And at the bottom of the console, you can select the Download Slides button to view a PDF version of the slide deck. We're going to follow the presentation today with a Q&A session, so please submit your questions during or after the presentation using the Q&A box at the right of your window. All right, I think we're ready to begin. Um, Rob, go ahead and take us away. Thank you very much. This is Rob Wilson, Statistical Scientist at Roe. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to provide a high-level roadmap for developing analysis plans for ISSs and ISEs, integrated summaries of safety and, and integrated summaries of efficacy. The roadmap is based on published FDA guidance documents, but predominantly is based on our experience developing numerous uh, ISS and ISE analysis plans and through our interactions with the FDA. The presentation will proceed generally in the following manner. First, we'll provide some context and background on the scope of ISSs and ISEs. Secondly, we'll spend a fair amount of time discussing ISSs. In particular, we'll lay out some high-level considerations and we'll outline three key questions we feel need to be asked at the time of planning the ISS analysis. Finally, we'll move on to the ISE. Due to its more specific and less exploratory nature, We'll take a different approach in presenting an outline of keys to success in the ISE. We'll present a targeted list of do's and don'ts. So first, some context. <clears throat> an NDA, or any marketing application for that matter, includes information about product from inception through clinical testing. Note that an ISS and an ISE are limited to summaries describing clinical safety and efficacy of the product. Any preclinical work that was done would be located elsewhere. The scope of an ISS and ISE statistical analysis plan are typically limited to new integrated analyses not performed in the individual study level clinical study reports. In other words, this is not mere duplication. We're providing an overall safety and efficacy profile of the product. <clears throat> We're providing information that was not provided in the individual study level clinical reports. So what are the overall goals of an ISS? Primarily, it is to describe the overall safety profile of the product. Well, what does this mean? What are some of the metrics? A few are listed here. <clears throat> so, for example, perhaps providing an analysis of safety-related event rates, which of course is quite common, estimating event uh, risk over time, exploring possible subgroup differences, identifying risk, risk factors associated with events. Now, of course, uh, depending on the product, uh, the, the type of product, <clears throat> uh, the, the type of approval that's required, uh, there may be much more than this uh, that is needed. And of course, in most instances, much more is needed. However, in our experience, uh, only one or two of these may be required uh, and, and little exploration is required. Well, what can we expect a regulatory reviewer will be looking at with regard to the metric chosen for summary? Well, this is outlined for us. Uh, in, in quite a bit of detail in the 2005 FDA safety review guidance. <clears throat> One can expect at a minimum that a regulatory reviewer will be doing the following, identifying and examining serious adverse events that could be related to the drug, identifying and examining the, the frequency of common adverse events that could be related to the drug, identifying factors that predict the occurrence of adverse events, adequacy of exposure, and so on. Now, let me just note, with respect to exposure, what I'm talking about here is duration, time, population, follow-up time, and so on. In particular, the reviewer will be assessing the applicability of the safety findings from the studies in the program to the target market population. It is our experience that, at a minimum, these tasks will be conducted and completed by the reviewer, and there may uh, be questions associated with them. Before we get to our three key questions one should ask at the time of ISS analysis development, there are some guiding principles we must consider. 
First, as we all know, a safety review will include a biostatistical and a clinical component, and the ISS guiding principles should be sufficiently broad to cover both areas. So we think we've done that here. Um, in, in general, we, we see one primary guiding principle and a couple of secondary principles. So first, the primary. <clears throat> the primary guiding principle of an ISS is to produce reliable estimates of safety parameters important to describing the overall safety profile. Secondarily, we most likely uh, would like to include adverse events of special interest and groups or populations of special interest in our ISS. Another secondary consideration is that the ISS is exploratory. In other words, there's little, if any, formal statistical testing. In most cases, there won't be any. The ISS, by definition, is exploratory. Although exploratory, we're still interested in expressing the uncertainty of parameter estimates, which we'll discuss in just a little bit. We're analyzing data with a view towards detecting any potential safety signal, not just those that are predefined. So some uh, informal statistical testing is performed but not of the kind we might see in a phase two or a phase three trial with considerations for multiple comparisons, alpha control, and so on. So how is an ISS different from the analyses in a phase two or a phase three study? Again, based on our experience, and, and this is also laid out in, uh, in FDA guidance, <clears throat> most phase two, phase three studies are designed to establish effectiveness. They are not designed to test safety hypotheses or identify adverse events with predefined, uh, predefined level of specificity. In other words, formal safety comparisons are limited. The ISS is intended to address that deficiency by combining and aggregating data. And that should be kept in mind as one is designing the ISS in not repeating phase two or phase three analyses. The typical ISS uh, analysis plan, SAP, is designed to explore safety data from the entire program. So what key questions help to formulate the roadmap or provide the structure for an ISS analysis? Well, we think there are three, three key questions, uh, and we think these questions should be asked uh, and answered in the order that they're presented on the slide shown on the screen. <clears throat> the reason for the second point there will be made clear, hopefully, before the end of the ISS presentation. So first, key question one, what are the safety parameters of interest? Uh, it, in, incumbent upon those creating a, an analysis plan is, is that we incorporate the key safety messages in determining what the safety parameters are of interest. Secondly, how do we present and analyze data to convey key safety messages and describe the overall safety profile? <clears throat> Third, how do we best characterize information from the studies in our program? In other words, what data or studies, if any for that matter, should be combined and how should they be combined to produce our estimates. Note that a lot of time is often spent on question three, and that is often the first question that is asked as opposed to the last. Again, we'll get to that point a little bit later. <clears throat> These are some of the questions to consider when developing an ISS plan, and we think should be uh, uh, considered when developing an ISS plan, not after the ISS plan has been developed. So let's start with question one. What are the safety parameters of interest? In general, there are three sets of safety parameters that should be, three general groups of safety parameters that should be considered uh, to be included in an ISS. Most often, uh, you will want to include safety parameters from all three buckets. The first are those specified in agency guidance, and for the most part, those can be found in the guidance document that's referenced uh, at the end of this slide presentation. <clears throat> Secondly, safety parameters that are of a priori uh, special interest or concern to the program or the compound. And lastly, those that are identified based on a data review. Let's talk about the second and third a little bit more. Uh, many times, and, and, and to, to many folks, uh, correctly so, safety summaries are characterized by events that are expected and those that are not. The latter, of course, requires much more clinical clarification. Those that are uh, expected are typically identified in the second bucket, those that are of a priori special interest or concern to the program or compound. In other words, something is already known about these events. As to the third, it is important that a data review be conducted prior to creating the ISS and preferably before the ISS analysis plan is developed 
to identify potential safety signals in events that were not expected. Again, those, of course, require more clinical, clinical clarification and may require additional analyses. Now, very little of the following should be surprising to most of us on the phone, um, uh, but I think it's important that, that we step through these questions in this uh, very logical uh, order and consider this. So what are some common examples of safety parameters of interest that should be addressed in an integrated summary of safety? Well, ex for example, as I've touched on, exposure, uh, time, duration, population exposed, et cetera. Concomitant medications, use, frequency, duration, et cetera. Deaths, of course, very, very important to a reviewer uh, and something uh, that, that requires great investigation should deaths occur in the program uh, where it's not an endpoint or expected. Adverse experiences, uh, more specifically occurrence, relatedness, uh, severity of the experiences, seriousness, duration, uh, timing, as well as other issues. Laboratory measures, uh, in particular central tendency uh, and time, uh, shifts from baseline, Similarly, with vital signs in terms of tendency and time shift from baseline and other safety explorations, which uh, may require uh, extensive thought uh, depending on the compound, uh, of in, uh, the compound under study. Uh, there are, of course, other safety explorations that are specified in agency guidance, uh, in particular drug-induced liver toxicities and others. <clears throat> Although all of these parameters are quite common, the level of emphasis and level of investigation required in addition to the methods used to quantify these parameters will vary based on the type of application, class of drug, and other factors. So before closing out question one, we ask ourselves, will the summary of estimates of these parameters sufficiently describe the overall drug profile? Well, in our experience, this sometimes requires a number of iterations, uh, finding that we've uh, found uh, all of the parameters we feel we need to characterize the drug profile in the first pass, uh, other times, again, having to iterate through numerous times. Um, but after some number of iterations, hopefully, at some point, the answer must be yes. The summary of the estimates of these parameters will sufficiently describe the overall safety, uh, the overall drug profile. But there may be more to do, and this is specific to an ISS, and something you typically won't see uh, done in an individual clinical study level report. Are there other clinically relevant priorities and or populations of interest? Well, presumably there are. And of course, this requires discussions, sometimes detailed discussions uh, with, with your clinical group. Assuming that there are clinically relevant priorities or groups of interest, this may indicate that something beyond simple summaries are required. Additional methods, and just to point out a very simple one, for example, individual pairwise comparisons, may be needed. Again, working with a statistician in conjunction with a clinical group, uh, one can focus, um, focus in on those parameters that are required to answer these second set, this second set of questions. So we've established the key safety parameters of interest, again, perhaps after a number of iterations. How do we present these parameters? In other words, what should the analysis and presentation approach accomplish? Well, a couple of guiding principles. First and foremost, it should help a reviewer uh, get, a, get at the true value of a parameter of interest. An example here might be an event rate in our population. <clears throat> it should estimate the parameter with a high degree of confidence. <clears throat> estimate the parameter with a high degree of confidence uh, in other words, maximum precision and minimum bias. Secondly, the analysis and presentation approach should permit a reviewer to make meaningful comparisons between active groups and placebo most often, but of course with any other appropriate comparator group. In other words, as we all know, an absolute means very little unless it's been compared to something. So let's take a look at these two goals a little bit more closely. So as to the first, how can, how can we characterize the chosen safety parameters? Well, we have many choices. I've listed methods that are common, uh, most often, to epidemiologic analyses, 
and are very often found in ISSs, which in a way are an extension of uh, epidemiologic studies. So, for example, uh, we could characterize the chosen safety parameters via proportions or accrued rate. Uh, I think we're all quite familiar with those, particularly in event analyses. An incident rate, in other words, some sort of rate uh, per unit time, could be number of events uh, uh, per, per patient year of exposure or something to that effect. Total incidence rate, events per unit time, similar, but using event as the uh, unit of measure. In other words, events may occur multiple times per person, person and exposure periods could vary. This is where this, uh, this particular uh, characterization of a parameter may be useful. Uh, time to event, uh, in other words, a life table rate. Uh, an extension of that would be uh, calculating the hazard of an event and so on. There are many others uh, under that particular bucket. Continuous measurements. Uh, for example, shifts and changes from baseline. And uh, also, I should mention listings and profiles of rare events of interest. Again, while this may not occur in the study level analyses, it probably is fruitful to do this in the ISS. Uh, and a viewer often will provide feedback if these are not uh, pr provided. So as to the second part uh, of key question two, how do we compare uh, to, to and across how do we compare to control across and within groups of interest? Again, one has many choices, and the choices are spec specific to the intended comparison, the questions we would like to answer, etc. Uh, as noted on the pr prior slide, these methods are common to epidemiologic analyses um, and are probably quite common to most all of us on the phone. <clears throat> so let me just list off a few of these. For example, uh, we could uh, compare across within groups based on difference in proportions or ratio of proportions. This, of course, is quite common. A difference in rates or a ratio of rates. <clears throat> Hazard ratios, uh, survival curves and comparing the differences in survival curves, a difference in means, um, et cetera. Now, a question that often comes up, and we've discussed a little bit here, are, are there formal comparisons made? In other words, uh, the inevitable question, are there p-values? <clears throat> Well, the answer is sometimes, uh, but comparisons here differ from formal comparisons in an efficacy setting, as I've mentioned earlier. Here, comparisons uh, may be made, but they're made for the purpose of assuring that uh, no safety signal is missed, not for the purposes of ultimately uh, proving uh, or disproving, rejecting, et cetera, a hypothesis. So, We've come up with a list of methods to characterize our parameters and the methods we'll use to compare across or within groups. But before finalizing uh, and making sure we've got a complete list here, it's important to consider the following. Are there any questions of special interest? And I think you'll find, uh, if, this, if one is working on their first ISS, that, that this will require uh, substant substantial time, uh, substantial thought, and perhaps substantial research. So some examples of some key questions of special interest that we've come across in our experience, and this is, of course, not an all-inclusive list. <clears throat> Are there specific adverse experiences of, uh, an a priori clinical, of a priori clinical importance? Are there special populations of a priori clinical importance? Are there pre-existing conditions or com comorbidities of special interest? Is there a temporal relationship or a relationship to exposure time? Uh, what about AE reoccurrence? Uh, are, are there excessive withdrawals from treatment in, the, in an active arm at a particular dose level of the active arm? Are there patterns of occurrence with respect to events? Are there drug-induced toxicities, perhaps, that uh, w one may expect to find or perhaps one did not expect to find but are now, uh, can now be explored and perhaps now become evident based on pooled aggregated data? Now, there's an important point here that is often lost. Everything is not okay. Focus is quite important. Listing off and including all potential questions of special interest in an ISS uh, can be quite time-consuming for a reviewer to call through and difficult for a writer to summarize. I, I, I've heard this phrase used before, and I, and I found it to be quite useful. <clears throat> and I'm going to paraphrase it here. It was actually across several sentences. But essentially, don't send a mine and tell the agency to find the diamonds. Focus here, in particular, on these questions of special interest and send the agency the diamonds instead. A lot of legwork on this particular question this particular set of questions will go a long way towards, uh, ultimately, towards approval. <clears throat> Before we close out question two, 
there are a couple of special challenges and issues that require some special attention. And I'm just going to mention a few here, but these are the most common uh, that, that have come up in our experience and I think that reviewers uh, frequently see uh, when reviewing summaries of safety. The first is variable lengths of follow-up and exposure. Um, a, a, an easy example here is uh, we have, let's say, two studies. Uh, in one study, subjects were uh, dosed for one month and followed for one month. In another study, subjects were uh, dosed for six months and followed for an additional six months. Uh, comparing across treatment groups where, it, where the potential for varying lengths of follow-up and exposure uh, exists, um, we need to be careful in the metrics that are used uh, to compare across those groups. Again, a statistician uh, is aware of methods and, and can help with those comparisons. A second common challenge is, is, it, is with respect to uncontrolled studies and similarly to unblinded studies. Um, there's often uh, a desire to combine uncontrolled or unblinded studies with placebo-controlled or appropriately controlled studies, and I would caution against that. Uh, this is a common mistake made in integrated summaries of safety. Again, a statistician can help fill in the details there. But my one recommendation here on these topics, no matter what you might encounter, is that these should be discussed and handled early in the ISS analysis development process. There is great uh, value in providing some forethought rather than uh, rather than afterthought in how these issues are handled. <clears throat> so now the third question, which I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on, which is how do we best characterize information from the studies in the program? <clears throat> well, we've answered the first two questions. So uh, said another way, how do we bring the data together from across the entire program? Regardless of anything else I say here with respect to this third question, please walk away with the following, and that is that we're trying to paint an objective picture of the safety profile of the product. And whatever pooling or integrating of data that we do should ultimately meet this goal. With that as background, let me lay out a few guiding principles uh, that, that we found to be helpful uh, and we think that are uh, required when thinking this, through this particular issue. So first, there's a regulatory obligation to present all safety data. That is unequivocal. All safety data must be presented to the agency. We can include all uh, studies in a safety database within a program. What that doesn't mean, and there is no regulatory obligation, that we pool all the studies for analysis into a single group. So let me clarify. Although we need to discuss all safety data and all potential safety findings and all safety signals, and we perhaps may bring all that data together for the application, we don't necessarily need to analyze the data all together in one uh, giant pool, for example. There's no regulatory obligation to do so. Uh, smaller pools of data uh, with, with uh, commonly designed protocols uh, with co uh, common endpoints and perhaps common follow-up times can be pooled together to describe the safety profile of the product, and multiple pools can be used. Ultimately, and this is a key takeaway message here as well, pooling is ultimately the sponsor's decision. This is not an FDA agency or any regulatory decision. You may get feedback from the agency on your pooling strategy, but ultimately it is the sponsor's decision. Note, however, that the FDA, in, in, in our experience, or an advisory committee must be convinced of the validity of the strategy. So it, although it's the sponsor's decision, uh, the FDA must be convinced that we've pre presented uh, an objective picture of the safety profile of the product. Well, the question may be asked, why do we pool data? <clears throat> well, there are really two answers to that question, uh, and they are as follows. One, we'd like to produce precise, reliable estimates, in other words, narrow confidence intervals, <clears throat> of safety parameters used to, to describe the overall safety profile. So, for example, we might like to come up with a, an estimate of the incidence rate of, of uh, events of potential sp uh, special interest. Well, we can use the individual studies to do that, but our confidence intervals uh, may be relatively wide given the number of subjects we have in the study um, or for other issues. When we pool together data, we aggregate data across a program, we are uh, presumably going to come up with a more precise estimate uh, of the incidence rate of an event of special interest or group of events of special interest for the population uh, for which labeling is intended, and uh, presumably we will come up with more narrow confidence intervals as well. A second example, and perhaps more apropos, is that of rare events. Rare events, which of course are perhaps unlikely to 
uh, are difficult to identify in a clinical study uh, individually may become more apparent uh, and a more precise, more reliable estimate of that rate may be apparent given the pooled data. The second reason is that interaction ex exploration were otherwise not uh, was were interaction exploration, which was otherwise not possible, uh, is now possible due to the increased sample size. So what you'll find that it, it, with both of these, uh, the answer uh, to, to, to the wide pool data question really comes down to sample size. We have more subjects. We have greater uh, uh, we have greater power to produce more precise, more reliable estimates and explore interactions, perhaps in subgroups of interest or in those mandated by the agency, where we otherwise could not do so. <clears throat> A few general principles. We'd like to combine data in the most valid ways. And that, that's a relatively obvious statement. Uh, but, but what flows from that is that the, the, the safety message should drive the pooling strategy, not the other way around. Frequently, uh, we are presented with um, a, a pooling strategy uh, that has already, uh, and already, already been developed, um, yet the, uh, the actual questions that one would like answered and the safety messages that should accompany that pooling strategy haven't been fully developed. Um, what we're left with then, uh, if these questions essentially are asked in reverse, uh, asked in reverse um, is we're left to see what questions we can answer based on the pooling strategy as opposed to developing a pooling strategy that can answer the questions of interest and those that are required for approval. Now, in terms of combining data in the most valid ways, this comes down to judgment, and there may be more than one right way. In our experience, there are often many right ways to pool data. There are certainly also wrong ways to pool data, in our opinion. <clears throat> A second principle is that the summaries uh, produced from the pooled data should yield transparent results. The key point here is that there should be no masking of safety signals. In other words, pooling together very heterogeneous studies um, may not allow a, a reviewer or perhaps the sponsor to identify potentially important safety signals. Third, the estimates should be as unbiased as possible. <clears throat> so what are a few issues to consider? Generally speaking, this comes down to protocol relatedness. In a perfect world, we'd like to pull studies where uh, the designs uh, are very similar, the doses studied are identical, uh, the, the duration of uh, not only dosing but follow-up uh, is similar, if not identical. The studies are uh, uh, controlled, uh, well, for that matter, un uncontrolled, but, but they really should be separated. And the choice of control is identical. So, for example, controlled studies, two-arm controlled studies being pulled together where placebo is the comparator, uh, and, and uh, th there's, again, that single active arm at the dose of interest. Regions are similar. Uh, populations are identical. In particular here, looking at the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Now, the key point to keep in mind here is that as uh, studies are pooled together, are brought together for analysis, uh, that are different in one or more of these factors will introduce variation into the parameters of interest, and we start to lose uh, uh, some of the desired effects in, our, uh, in answering key questions one and two. <clears throat> so I've provided some background uh, that, that we think can be useful in creating ISS analysis plans, provided the three key questions which can be used to provide a roadmap to create a complete safety analysis of, of a product, at this point, now Ben is going to step in and talk about uh, key points and some do's and don'ts in particular in developing an integrated summary of efficacy. So the first thing you'll notice is that Rob had about 20 plus slides and I have maybe five. And this is no accident. Uh, the, the ISS and ISC are very different in that the, the ISS is more exploratory. There's a lot more to look at. And the ISC should be very focused predefined, and, and limited. Uh, you, the objective here is not to present everything, it's to provide a very laser-focused orientation for a reviewer so they get a good picture of what the true efficacy of your product is. And this also plays out in, the, uh, in just the count of displays between the ISS and ISE. Uh, we frequently see a 10 to 1 ratio for uh, the number of displays for the ISS versus the ISE. So not surprisingly, the FDA does have a guidance 
uh, for what should be included in the ISC. Uh, the ISC must include a summary of the data that demonstrates the effectiveness of each claimed indication. Uh, it should support the dosage that you're proposing on the label. You should also look into uh, the efficacy by sex, age, and racial subgroups. This is due diligence. You just want to make sure that your product uh, does have – it's effective in uh, a wide variety of subgroups and that nothing pops out surprising there. And then also you need to investigate any evidence that there might be particular subgroups that need modification of dosing. And this might be, for example, in opioids. If you have subjects that are opioid naive versus experienced and you're seeing different effects there, this needs to be investigated. This is all related to the ISC document itself, as well as sections 254 and 273 of the CTD. Uh, but more specifically, the efficacy analyses should uh, cover some certain objectives. First off, you want to obtain a more precise estimate of the primary efficacy endpoints, as well as the key secondary endpoints, and investigate any pre-specified subgroup uh, effects that would uh, perhaps be different among the different uh, subgroups. So, key considerations for the ISC analyses. First off, they need to rely on your pivotal phase C trials. You really need to have good alpha control, and this, uh, this spans everything with the ISC. You don't want to throw in everything. Phase two trials are typically not included because they lack this tight alpha control. Uh, you might be looking at many different dosages, uh, adaptive designs, and ultimately, the phase twos are hypothesis generating, whereas the phase threes are confirming these hypotheses. What you choose as your dosage and your outcomes in the phase three are the best results from your phase two. And so if you start combining these best results of the phase two, that, that doesn't uh, give the, the best estimate of the true efficacy of your product. Again. The agency really wants to see tight type 1 error control, alpha control. This should not be a fishing, uh, fishing, fishing expedition, and you don't want to just capitalize on chance by looking at every single possible efficacy outcome. So what this means is, ideally, the ISC is small. Uh, it should focus on the primary endpoints or co-primary if there are uh, more than one kind of feeding into that, that uh, primary endpoint. Consider only key secondary endpoints with clear clinical relevance, and these should also be secondary endpoints where there was alpha control in the pivotal studies to kind of back up any p-values or hypothesis testing that you're doing. Uh, the explorations should be limited to things of interest. Don't start looking for a subgroup in your phase three where this product just looks great. Uh, if, if, your, if your pivotals do not show success on your primary, you probably will not be able to proceed by looking at a subgroup. And much like Rob was uh, discussing earlier, everything is not okay. You want to make this very focused, and by doing so, you're, you're convincing the, uh, the agency that you have a very good story about your efficacy, here's good evidence of it, and if they want more details about all the other uh, possible outcomes, these can be found in the individual CSRs of your pivotals as well as the phase twos. Some other possible presentations which uh, may need to be included are demographics and baseline characteristics of these pooled groups. And this is for label support. Who are the people in these studies? Uh, sometimes your study feasibility versus what you want to get on the label don't quite align. So you want to provide evidence to support that the subjects in your study really are the ones that will be taking this drug per the label. Uh, an example might be uh, for chronic pain indication, you're, you might use osteoarthritis pain subjects and lower back pain subjects. And so you need to justify why you should have a label for chronic pain based on, on this population. You also need to highlight any relevant differences in the study populations. Uh, again, in my above example, uh, if you do a pooled analysis of these two different groups, 
you need to uh, highlight any difference in the inclusion and exclusion, the population, uh, maybe age differences, things of that nature that might influence the, uh, the validity of pulling the data. And as I said, ISC is much simpler uh, in terms of actually accomplishing this. It's, it's usually uh, not the, the limiting factor in getting a NDAN. Uh, the ISS really truly is the limiting factor, and the ISC is something that can be accomplished on the side uh, while putting together a lot of these data sets and displays for the ISS. So these are our key considerations for uh, designing an ISS and ISC. And Rebecca, we'll hand it back to you for any questions. Okay, so we're uh, ready to go on to our Q&A portion of the presentation. Um, we've got a lot of really great questions, um, and we're going to try to get to all of them. Um, and if we don't get to all of them, don't forget we'll uh, be able to get back to everyone um, personally after the webinar. But here we go with our first question. Um, okay, so this one. Should the ISS SAP be designed at the same time as you're designing your phase three clinical studies, i.e. a very long time before you're starting to assemble your NDA? Uh, th th this, is, uh, th this is Rob. Uh, my opinion and experience is yes, and I would even suggest and have some experience with uh, designing the ISS SAP uh, actually even earlier than the phase three study. Um, we actually have some experience essentially with starting at the, the back end of a study, knowing what we have to have uh, as part of the approval process, uh, designing what, what a perfect ISS SAP would look like in terms of analysis, displays, and everything else, obviously in the absence of data, and then uh, essentially creating the program from the, uh, the, the back end up to the front. Um, so, so yes, the short answer is as early as possible, very beneficial. Uh, d designing the ISS SAP after the phase three is over, um, as many of us have experience with, um, can often be a uh, slow, time-consuming uh, uh, process where, where some of that work could have been done while the phase twos and threes were being conducted. Okay, great. Um, all right, this next question. Um, is the efficacy data collected in open-label long-term studies pulled with blinded in the ISD? Yes, you can do that. Uh, I would recommend presenting it both ways, both with and without. Uh, again, the objective is to get the most precise estimate. And so by including that open label data, you're, it, it might be a biased estimate in that you know, people who know they're on active drug, uh, if it's a PRO or something like that, uh, they might be re reporting some slightly more positive effects. Uh, however, um, it does add some additional information. However, you do want to do a pooling of just a double-blind study so you don't have that in there. So the agency can see it both ways. Uh, what does this look like over a very long period of time as well as what does it look like uh, only limited to the double-blind studies. Uh, related to that also, uh, for every efficacy pooling, you want to be certain that you have a safety pooling which is analogous. Now this isn't true going the other way. You can do safety points above and beyond what you present in the efficacy. But for every efficacy claim, uh, claim, every look at the efficacy, you really need to have a parallel safety look just so you can have that balance of the, the safety related to a particular efficacy outcome. Okay, great. All right, the next question we've got here, um, someone wants to give your opinion on pooling studies in ISE. Uh, I think I might have addressed some of that uh, with uh, regarding the open label, but in addition, I would say also, um, if studies are poolable and it makes clinical sense to put them together, then absolutely do that. On the flip side of it, there's a feasibility question. If you really do have different populations, different outcomes, and things of that nature, if it doesn't make sense to pool, do not do that. And then you can just rely on the individual CSRs. Um, and if you look at the guidance document and uh, the, the layout of the ISC, uh, there are results from individual studies and then results from uh, pulled analyses, spanning studies. And so if your story really is in the individual studies and you cannot combine data in a way that's reasonable, then just don't do that. 
All right, great. I uh, have another question for us. Uh, for safety data sets in the ISS, should all studies, including other indications, uh, be included or only studies supporting the filing indication? Yeah, um, my short answer to that is uh, I would discuss this with the review division. Um, I actually have experience handling this a couple of different ways. Uh, one is that uh, due to the similarity of the indications, the similarity of the dosing, et cetera, data were actually pooled together in a particular pooling group and they were presented together. I also have experience where uh, the, the review division requested that the data be included in the summary of safety but it not be pulled together. I, I think the best advice I can offer here is discuss this with your review division, make sure they're comfortable with the decision, and then proceed with the analysis accordingly. Absolutely, and actually that goes for all our responses thus far is every opportunity that you have for agency interaction, try to have as much transparency as possible to really let them know what you're planning and get feedback whether they, they agree with, uh, with your plans. All right, great. Um, here's another question we've got from the audience. Um, should you create integrated data sets for outcomes that are not presented in the ISS ISD? Yes and no. Uh, for, in terms of you know, key drivers for getting yourself to submission, only focus on what you need. However, beyond that, if you have time and opportunity, it's great to have those things available, especially if you see, foresee an ad com coming up. Uh, by having very good data sets, you can get to a lot of analyses very quickly. And so being prepared with that uh, really helps out in terms of, you know, you get a question back from the FDA, and if you can turn it around in a matter of days, that looks really good. And that happens when you have good data sets that cover everything. On the other hand, it can be a time waster if uh, there are just things that are not of interest to the agency, and uh, will never be looked at. So it, it's a balance. Um, one convenient thing is that in terms of kind of timelines for getting a submission in, uh, usually the, the statisticians uh, will hand off displays to the writers, then they have some time, and then there's some time for the publishing. And so that's one thing to consider is while those, uh, the authorship and publishing is going on, uh, move your statisticians from these critical tasks for those uh, outcomes included in the, uh, in the ISS and ISC, move them off to kind of supporting some other things which a reviewer may want to see, but it's not certain. All right, great. Um, and here's another question for us. Uh, how should you approach integration if efficacy outcomes from the pivotal trials are different? That is always a little tricky. Um, if they are absolutely different, then you just simply can't integrate. If they are similar, then that's when you can consider um, doing your pooled analyses to follow what you think is the best analysis. So let's say you have a, a responder outcome, and in your first pivotal trial, you do it one way, and you learn some things, and so you tweak the, the precise definition of responder. And this is what's used in the second pivotal analysis. Whether or not you have quote unquote successful trials really depends on what you see in those pivotals. But when you go to pool the analyses, if you have all the data necessary to use that second definition, that's better definition, you can absolutely uh, go back to the, your first pivotal trial, use that responder outcome, and pull with uh, the identical, the now identical outcome in that second pivotal. Again, you need to be very transparent with this for the agency and make it clear that what you're presenting in this pooled analysis is not precisely what was done in individuals. So in that case, they can look at the individual CSRs, see what happened there, see what happens when you use this updated uh, pooled analysis. Now, if you're going from a successful uh, outcome in the individual analysis to a successful one in the pooled analysis, this won't raise any eyebrows. However, this does not mean that if you have a failed trial, you can change the definition and then use that definition in the um, second trial and the pooled analysis and claim success. All right, great. 
Um, for an NDA, do all study level data and integrated data need to be submitted in CDIS compliant format? Bob, you want to take this? Sure. Um, well, as of right now, the answer is, is, a, is a tentative no. Um, however, uh, whatever uh, data format decisions uh, that, that one would like to make uh, and, and, and the data format that one proposes to, to submit their data in should be discussed with the agency. And there are a number of uh, regulatory uh, pathways to not only asking that question but, but getting a response, and, and I suggest um, that, that that be done. Now, recently, uh, as many of you probably know, just a couple of days ago, the agency issued some draft guidance with respect to um, standards uh, in regards to marketing applications, uh, ISS and ISD data sets, and supporting study level data sets, and uh, within the next couple of years, greatly paraphrasing here, um, the, well, the answer will no longer be a conditional no, you really don't have to do it, but, but discuss it with the agency. Uh, the answer will be an unequivocal yes. Everything that's uh, submitted as part of a marketing application uh, will need to be uh, submitted in uh, CDISC or other relevant standard, as described in this document, uh, compliant format. <clears throat> Okay, great. Um, I think we've got time for a couple more questions here. Um, how does the planned product label play into the design of an ISS and or ISD? Really, the label should almost drive everything. Uh, we're, we're strongly of the opinion that that's kind of your end product of the, uh, of the whole submission is that your product label. What are you saying that your drug does and what are the risks associated with it? So that certainly lays out uh, the, the kind of foundation for these analyses. Uh, everything on there has to be supported by the analyses and also by the trials. Uh, you, uh, we have certainly seen instances where um, you, you get, get to the end and you realize that you might not have uh, the trials to support what you're trying to get your label for, and that's, uh, that's really unfortunate. And so keeping that end product in, in mind uh, throughout the whole process really, uh, really aids in uh, having a good plan from the start for your product development. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question here. Um, should all studies in a program be integrated into the safety and efficacy databases? Okay, and I, and I think we've uh, kind of touched on this. Um, it, no, not necessarily. Uh, again, just integrate things where, in terms of the data sets, you want to integrate studies where you will have a presentation of data which span those studies. Uh, if you have phase ones that aren't being integrated with anything, you don't need to get those into the integrated data sets. But wherever you would need to support a display which shows uh, data presented across multiple studies, uh, you're going to need an integrated data set to back that up. Rob, anything to add? No, I agree with that. It's a nice summary. Yep. All right, great. Well, um, as I said, that's, uh, I think that's the last question that we have time for today. Um, uh, we had a lot of great questions. As I said, um, we couldn't get to them all, but we will be getting back to everyone who submitted uh, personally after the webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending this Fierce Live webinar and submitting so many great questions. Um, I want to thank our speakers for participating and Roe for sponsoring. Um, and this webinar has been recorded. You'll be able to access the recording within 24 hours on the same page that you used to register for the event. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.